you're on mute. We can't hear you. Yeah, um, Megan, you're on mute. Sorry. Yes, I've got the uh, the schedule open here, so I can announce that. <clears throat> so we are. Oh my gosh, it's October already. Sorry. <laughs> It's uh, Jill Becker on the 21st of October is our next speaker. Correct. Great, so Ankush, I see that you're now host. I don't think Christian made me co-host. So Just maybe give me a second, I'll make you a co-host, yeah. Case. Yeah, I, I'm always a little bit nervous about the Zoom meeting. Although Megan, you don't need to worry. The Zoom, we'll the Zoom platform is so much easier than that other platform we were using, right? Oh my gosh, that was painful. <laughs> yeah, I made both of you co-hosts. Thank you, Ankush, and it's really nice to meet you. Keep in touch. Let me know what your research interests are. And um, I well. am interested in working on depression, and so. I mean, your lab was one of the, uh, you know, priority labs for my PhD applications. I, I completed my bachelor's this year and I was looking for research assistant positions and all. So, yeah, if I'm applying for a PhD, I'll obviously apply for your lab. Fantastic. Yeah, keep in touch. Yeah. Okay. We have participants joining in. It's been a it's been a while since I've hosted. Um, I can see we have people starting to join already. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can, um, yep, so we're kind of ticking up on the participant count. So I think at the hour we'll get started and I will um, basically just quickly, you know, turn it over to, to you, Ankush, to do the, the formal introduction. So we try to give max time for the, the speaker and for questions. Yep. Um, if there's anything else I should mention, don't hesitate to, to jump in. Um, it's been a, it's been a while since I've since we hosted. So yeah, that sounds good. So we have three minutes before we start, and. So even well, while you introduce me, uh, maybe also uh, tell the attendees that they can put in their question and questions in the Q&A and stuff. Thank you. 
Okay, so I think I'll just give until one more minute um, for a couple more participants to trickle in. We've had a bit of an uptick. <clears throat> and while we're waiting to get started, um, I'll remind everybody who is already on the call uh, that the next seminar will be in two weeks uh, on October 21st, and we'll be hearing from Jill Becker about uh, sex differences in the propensity to, addic uh, to develop addiction. Okay, I guess you can start. Great, so thank you everyone for tuning in today for what promises to be a really excellent talk from Dr. Eric Nessler on the molecular and epigenetic basis of brain changes uh, that underlie persistent behavioral adaptations that happen with exposure to addictive drugs. Um, before I turn it over uh, to Anish Chakrabadi to introduce our speaker, I'll remind everyone uh, that these talks are being recorded um, and they can be watched later online at the Worldwide Neurobiology of Addiction website or on YouTube. I'll also remind everyone that uh, as we go through, they can post their questions in the chat and we'll try to answer them at the end of the talk, uh, but no need to save your questions till the very end. You can drop it in the chat as we go. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anish to introduce Dr. Eric Nessler. Yeah, thank you for joining in everyone. And today we have Dr. Nessler with us. Dr. Nessler is the Nash Family Professor of Neuroscience at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York where he serves as the Dean for Academic and Scientific Affairs and Director of Friedman Brain Institute. He received his BA, PhD and MD degrees and psychiatry residency training from Yale University. He served on the Yale faculty from 1987 to 2000, where he was the Elizabeth Mears and House Jameson Professor of Psychiatry, Pharmacology and Neurobiology and Director of the Division of Molecular Psychiatry. Dr. Nestler is a member of National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a past president of American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and the Society for Neuroscience. He has won numerous awards for his work, including Paul Hawk Distinguished Service Award from American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and the Dale Schimmer Distinguished Award in Biological Psychiatry from the Society of Biological Psychiatry. He's a founder and scientific advisory board chair for psychogenics and a member of the board of directors of Berg Pharma. The author of more than 650 publications and five books, the goal of Dr. Nessler's research is to better understand the molecular basis of drug addiction and depression. His research uses animal models of these disorders to identify the ways in which drugs of abuse or stress change the brain to lead to addiction or depression-like syndromes and to use this information to develop improved treatments of these disorders. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Nestler. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Ankush, and thanks also, Megan. You know, it's been a real pleasure for me to help uh, Megan and Christian and Marina and our co-hosts run this uh, program on addiction seminars and a, and a great uh, pleasure for me to uh, present to you all today. So let me share my screen and then we can get started. I assume everybody sees that okay. Um, so yeah. today, uh, as Ankush mentioned, I'll be talking about our work focused on transcriptional and epigenetic mechanisms of drug addiction. And I'll put this in some general context. Uh, we and many others over the years have proposed that drug addiction could be viewed as a form of drug-induced neural plasticity that's mediated at the level of changes in gene expression, mediated at least in part at, the, at, at that level. Uh, this is based on the idea that many features of drug addiction clinically uh, are very persistent. Uh, uh, increased risk of relapse can persist for a lifetime. Uh, and it, uh, this slide captures the uh, mechanisms by which we think drugs would produce that type of plasticity dependent on transcription. So drugs of abuse bind initially to proteins located at the extracellular aspect of synapses as shown here, receptors, transporters, channels. <clears throat> but even initial exposure to a drug of abuse would produce changes in intracellular signaling pathways. The idea is that repeated drug exposure, which is in general 
required to create a state of addiction would produce increasingly strong and building changes intracellularly, which would signal to the cell nucleus and regulate proteins called transcription factors that are specialized in binding to DNA in a sequence specific fashion. And these drug regulated transcription factors would then regulate a series of target genes that produce stable changes in neuronal function underlying portions of the very stable behavioral abnormalities that are used to define an addicted state. Now I wanna emphasize that to this day, all current medications and most in development that are used to treat addiction still focus at this extracellular level of analysis, leaving explicitly thousands of possible proteins unexplored uh, for potential therapeutics for drug addiction syndromes. I'll come back to that at the very end of my talk. In order to identify transcriptional mechanisms of addiction, one needs to know where in the brain to look. This is a sagittal or sideways cartoon of a rodent brain. Uh, human brain is highly homologous. Uh, identifying so-called brain reward regions that the field has defined over decades of research. Most focus has been placed on dopaminergic neurons arising in the ventral tegmental area of the ventral midbrain uh, that project to the forebrain, in particular, the nucleus accumbens, the portion of the ventral striatum, but the slide emphasizes the involvement of many other regions as well, for example, amygdala, hippocampus, broad regions of prefrontal cortex, among many others. Uh, it is felt that drugs of abuse produce addiction by producing pathological changes throughout this circuitry. Um, and the question is, what are the underlying molecular mechanisms of those changes? So I'm going to just begin by giving you a bit of a historic focus of the work that my lab has done over the last several decades. And we have focused initially primarily on two transcription factors, delta Fos B and CREB. Our initial focus on Delta Fos B was based on the finding uh, by Bruce Hope and colleagues that Delta Fos B was the only member of the Fos June family of proteins, given the name AP1, that was induced after chronic drug exposure. Uh, and this is depicted uh, in this uh, cartoon to the left, where we know that in response to a single drug dose, CFOS and other Fos family genes are induced very rapidly. Uh, but also decay very rapidly due to the instability of the RNAs and the encoded proteins. Delta Fos B we found was unique in that it was a stable isoform of a Fos family uh, transcription factor. And this stability means that in response to repeated drug exposure, the small amount of Fos B that's induced uh, with each drug exposure accumulates to the point where Delta Fos B becomes by far the predominant Fos family protein uh, present within uh, this re reward region, the nucleus accumbens. And in fact, we obtained data hypothesized without data and then confirmed with data that this accumulating delta Fos B in fact feeds back and then represses the induction of these other Fos family proteins creating what we called at the time a molecular switch. Uh, our focus on CREB, was based on related data uh, in that CREB is known as an effector of the cycle KMP pathway. It stands for um, uh, cycle KMP response element binding protein. Uh, and the cycle KMP pathway had been implicated in the actions of drugs of abuse in my lab and many other labs over the years. And indeed we showed that CREB is also induced in nucleus accumbens in response to acute and chronic drug exposure although the temporal features of, the of that induction show the more typical spike trough pattern as depicted in this cartoon to the right. And over the years, uh, a large amount of work, and I wanna give particular shout outs to two former postdocs in my lab, Bill Carlazon, who's now at Harvard, and David Self, who's now at UT Southwestern, um, provided evidence for the behavioral role played by the activation of these two transcription factors in the nucleus accumbens. We know that delta Fos B is induced selectively in only one type of neuron within the nucleus accumbens in response to all drugs of abuse, with the one exception being opioids, which induce delta Fos B more broadly. 
So for most drugs of abuse, delta-FOSB is induced only in the D1 type, meaning spinal neuron of nucleus accumbens. I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes in terms of what that means. And we've shown over the years by use of viral mediated gene transfer and inducible uh, transgenic mice, that induction of delta-FOSB in this one cell type increases an animal's sensitivity to drug and natural rewards and produces a positive motivational state uh, and drives drug self-administration and relapse presumably through a process of positive reinforcement. CREB in many ways can be viewed as doing the opposite functionally. First, it's induced equally in the D1 and D2 type of medium spiny neuron in nucleus accumbens, but it serves a more classic role as a mediator of drug tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal. Uh, it, in, in that vein, it reduces sensitivity to drug and natural rewards, produces a negative emotional state, but it too can drive self-administration and relapse, presumably through negative reinforcement. And starting at about 10 or 15 years ago, we decided to take a step back and use more open-ended approaches uh, with the advent of next generation sequencing to tell us more broadly uh, what role, what transcription factors and other nuclear proteins are most important in mediating the lasting effects of drugs of abuse on nucleus accumbens and other tissue. And this gets us into the question of epigenetics, which is I'm really using that word as, a, uh, as an abbreviation for chromatin biology. And th that notion is depicted in this cartoon, which shows the DNA double helix, uh, we know that a mammalian organism has about 3 billion nucleotide pairs, which would be about two meters in length if stretched out linearly. Yet we know that the DNA uh, genome can fit within a microscopic cell nucleus. And that organization, compaction, uh, we've learned a lot about in the last couple of decades describing chromatin biology, uh, which involves the DNA double helix wrapping around octomers of histone proteins to form the unit of chromatin called a nucleosome. Nucleosomes are then organized in very rote ways in the most condensed form to be recognized as a chromosome. This organization is important functionally because DNA and spans of chromatin where the nucleosomes are packed tightly together is not functional. It cannot, for example, serve as a template for RNA, whereas, DNA in more open areas of chromatin can be active. And this has made it possible to use chromatin measures as a way to help us identify those genes that are regulated by drug exposure, importantly, providing the first ever insight into transcriptional mechanisms in the brain in vivo, not relying on cultured cells where things are very different. And by analogy with the developmental biology and cancer biology fields, where certain types of epigenetic modifications that open or close chromatin once they occur are permanent for the lifespan of the organism. Our proposal at the time was that perhaps drug exposure can produce certain epigenetic modifications that are similarly long lived and drive some of the stability of behavioral abnormalities that define a state of addiction. Let me just provide a little bit more detail of these chromatin mechanisms at this level of analysis. Now, the, uh, these gold stripes are the DNA double helix wrapped around the histone octomers, these spheres to form uh, a nucleosome, showing the two ends of a spectrum, open active chromatin, closed inactive chromatin. And we've learned a great deal uh, over the last two decades in understanding what governs the transition between these two states which in some cases can be quite uh, permanent, but in other cases quite labile and, uh, and bidirectional. I'm just gonna give one example of these mechanisms, the addition of acetyl groups to histone uh, uh, subunits uh, catalyzed by histone acetyl transferases is one mechanism governing gene activation. Acetylation of histones can move the nucleosomes further apart allowing for the binding of transcription factors. I mentioned delta FOSB and CREB is just examples of transcription factors that my lab has been interested in. 
binding in a sequence specific manner to areas of DNA that are open enough to be exposed to those proteins, eventually leading to the recruitment of perhaps hundreds of proteins uh, as part of the basal transcription complex mediating the activation of a given gene. Uh, similarly, complex processes govern the opposite end of the spectrum, the repression of gene expression and the involvement of many uh, repressor uh, mechanisms. I'll just mention one example, a histone deacetylase that removes these acetyl groups. So as I alluded to earlier, the approach that my lab has been using then in the past decade has been an open-ended approach to allow biology to guide us to identify what are the most important mechanisms that are being regulated by drug exposure. That's depicted here by these Venn diagrams. We would use RNA sequencing to capture all the RNAs that are regulated in a tissue or cell type uh, in response to a certain treatment. Here's identifying a population of RNAs that are induced. There'd be another population of RNAs that are repressed. And if these RNAs are induced through transcriptional mechanisms, they will be associated with an increase in some histone or other chromatin mechanism that mediates gene activation, I mentioned acetylated histones, or a reduction in some repressive mechanism. We would identify genome-wide measures of these chromatin mechanisms using related tools like chip sequencing or more recently cut and run, uh, and also using those methods to identify genome-wide binding of the transcription factors that we're interested in, such as CREB, Delta Fos B, and others. This is an enormous bioinformatic undertaking. Uh, just doing uh, the experiments shown in this slide, one brain region, one time point, just capturing these methods might involve 20 terabytes of data. So this is a bioinformatic challenge, which honestly, I think we in the field are still trying to understand how to optimally mine. But we do think that this is the right approach because when we drill in on areas of overlap in these Venn diagrams, we can identify regulated genes which with far greater accuracy, far smaller false positive and false negative discovery rates as compared to relying on a single platform alone. So let me give you some examples of how we use these data. These are, uh, this is an experiment from a study done by Dina Walker, who's now at Oregon, and Aaron Kalapari, who's now at Vanderbilt, and others in the lab, who performed a very large RNA sequencing study that was published a few years ago. Uh, Aaron and Dina had mice self-administer cocaine or saline for a period of 10 days. We uh, harvested one cohort of animals 24 hours after the last uh, self-administration session. Other animals were uh, withdrawn from the drug in their home cages and 30 days later given a challenge injection of either cocaine or saline. So all told six treatment conditions. We captured six brain regions from each of these animals. Uh, the range of brain regions that I've mentioned earlier that formed the brain reward circuitry. Uh, and uh, I want to highlight the importance of this 30-day withdrawal time. So uh, other investigators in the field have shown that the way we would infer craving or relapse in a rodent increases during builds during this 30-day withdrawal period. So for example, at the 24-hour time point, we could put an animal back in the self-administration chamber and see to what extent do they press the cocaine paired lever, even if the lever giving them cocaine is turned off. And you see there's some behavior of pressing the lever. But after 30 days of withdrawal, that lever pressing increases. This is described in the field as incubation of cocaine craving. And so we're particularly interested in time dependent changes that occur during withdrawal that is related to this building of incubation. Let me give you an example of how we've used these data sets. I'm just showing you a small section of the data focusing on nucleus accumbens only. We use machine learning to identify those genes that are uniquely regulated at the 30 day time point. So I'm gonna be using these abbreviations a lot. So let me just go over what we were talking about. 24 hours after cocaine self-administration, 
30 days of withdrawal of saline self-administration, but a cocaine, then given a cocaine injection, essentially the animal's first ever, ever exposure to cocaine, essentially acute cocaine analyzed one hour later. Animals that self-administered cocaine withdrawn for 30 days given a saline injection, and then animals given that cocaine priming dose. And you can see on the left, uh, genes that are uniquely regulated up in yellow, down in blue, each vertical line would represent a single RNA uh, at the 30 day time point. And on the right, those genes that are uniquely regulated only in response to that priming dose of cocaine in animals with a history of self-administration. So if you focus on the heat maps at the right, you can compare the effect of one hour after a challenge dose of cocaine with this being the first ever exposure to cocaine, this being the same exposure to cocaine, but in animals with a distant history of cocaine self-administration, the dramatic degree to which the transcriptional response to that acute challenge dose changes uh, over time. Now we can also use machine learning to look on an individual animal basis and ask whether these gene expression changes are related to an animal, animal's individual behavioral responses. So now the heat map is not showing genes, but each horizontal line is showing a different behavior that comprises uh, self-administration, uh, the process of self-administration. And Dina Walker and colleagues uh, com came up with what we call the addiction index, a bit of, a, of, of, a, of an, an anthropomorphic stretch, but nevertheless describing what we felt was more addiction-like behavior uh, in, in a rodent. So you can see animals that self-administered saline, as would be expected, showed low levels of an addiction index score, whereas animals that self-administered cocaine showed quite very large degrees of variability in the addiction index. Some animals show very high levels, other animals much less so, even though every animal met criteria for cocaine self-administration. So what we did next was to then relate the two open-ended measures, identifying those genes up regulated in yellow, down regulated in blue, that are positively associated with the addiction index in red or negatively associated with the index in gray. Um, again, just a high level inference from these data is, is an interesting one. Notice how genes that are induced or repressed in response to a cocaine priming dose in animals with a history of cocaine self-administration, the same genes tended to be regulated in the opposite direction in response to the first ever exposure to cocaine. These are genes in the nucleus accumbens. This is really interesting because it suggests that an animal's transcriptional response in nucleus accumbens to a first ever exposure to cocaine might actually predict whether that animal is going to be addicted or not, or how addicted it might be to cocaine, even though the direction of regulation of those genes might be opposite uh, several months down the road. Uh, you can see that this pattern was not so overwhelming in other brain regions. I'm just showing you ventral hippocampal as a comparison. We could then ask what are the predicted transcription factors that would be expected to regulate these cohorts of genes? In other words, just based on the promoter sequences of these genic regions, what transcription factors are highly ranked among these regulated genes? And this shows the results of the, that analysis. We were of course very relieved to see that CREB and AP1 are among the highest ranked factors identified, showing that our initial hunches of studying these two transcription factors many years ago, delta FOS B being really the prominent AP1 factor present in the chronic drug treated state was, was valid. But we at the same time identified many additional transcription factors that are also highly ranked. And I'm just showing you E2F family factors and a retinoic acid receptor uh, as in red, because these are factors that we've since gone back and demonstrated directly uh, are involved in cocaine action, confirming these bioinformatic predictions. Because of the enormous vo volume of data that we have, we can do more than simply do differential gene analyses. 
all of these heat maps that show yellow and blue RNAs are, are genes, RNAs that are up or down regulated compared to another condition. But we can use what's called gene co-expression network analyses and identify modules of genes breaking the transcriptome up into these different modules shown here in a circos plot and so on. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna spend uh, more attention on this slide other than highlighting another recent study done by Dina Walker showing sex differences in cocaine responses. So what I'm showing you in this heat map now are genes that are induced in nucleus accumbens in yellow or downregulated in blue after chronic cocaine exposure in males and how those same genes are affected in females. You can see very little limited overlap between the two sexes. But in animals that are treated with adolescent stress, this is a social isolation condition during uh, juvenile periods, you can see that these transcriptional responses are mostly scrambled, obliterating these baseline sex differences. I'd be happy to tell you more about these analyses during the question period if, if you're interested. Now, all the work that I've highlighted so far has focused on sequencing bulk or crude homo whole homogenates of nucleus accumbens, despite the fact that we know that the cellular specificity of this brain area is essential to take into consideration. I mentioned earlier the two major projection subtypes of neurons, the D1 and D2 type medium spiny neurons, which together comprise about 95% of all neurons in the nucleus accumbens. And these two, um, subpopulations of neurons defined by their predominant expression of D1 or D2 dopamine receptors largely overlay with the direct projection pathway, mainly being the D1 receptor expressing nerve cells and the indirect pathway projection largely comprising the D2 uh, uh, population. This is critical because we and other groups, many other groups, have defined very different, in some cases, opposite roles of D1 and D2 medium spiny neurons in regulation of drug reward. And I'm just citing a recent uh, a study by Mary Kay Lobo, who's now at Maryland, and Erin Kalapari, uh, two studies from my lab, but there are many other labs that contributed to these conclusions. First of all, um, optogenetic or chemogenetic activation of these two cell populations produce opposite effects on cocaine reward. Activation of D1 medium spiny neurons in nucleus accumbens promotes reward. Activation of D2 medium spiny neurons has the opposite effect. More recently, uh, calcium imaging and fiber photometry and other approaches have shown that cocaine actually also exerts opposite effects on the functional activity of these two neuronal populations in awake behaving animals, where again, the data are complicated, but a general conclusion is that drug exposure tends to activate uh, D1 medium spiny neurons and represses the activity of D2 medium spiny neurons. So this has driven us more recently to carry out our sequencing analyses in a cell type specific manner, which is now becoming increasingly possible. So I wanna highlight unpublished work performed by Philip Muse uh, in the laboratory. Uh, Phil, Philip first carried out a method called ATAC sequencing, which is a way to capture the degree to which nucleosomes are spaced genome wide, performing this separately on sorted nuclei of D1 medium spiny neurons or D2 medium spiny neurons. The same experimental conditions that I've been describing to you so far. This is all summarized genome-wide over the transcription start sites of genes. So this is averaged out genome-wide. Notice how under control conditions, chromatin tends to be more open rather dramatically. This pink line in D2 medium spiny neurons. Actually, Hope Chromatin in the lab had shown previously that there are about twice as many transcripts at, expressed in D2 medium spiny neurons will be albeit many of them at very low levels. Notice how, how uh, 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 acute exposure to cocaine induces a dramatic opening of chromatin, 
This persists during 30 days withdrawal with a further opening seen but in response to that priming dose of cocaine, much more muted response in D2 meaning spiny neurons. Let me emphasize these are average responses. So within D2 and D1 meaning spiny neurons, there are genic regions that show opening and closing, but this is showing you the predominant response. Philip more recently has done RNA sequencing on similar sorted populations of D1 and D2 medium spiny neurons, demonstrating that this dramatic opening of chrominin in D1 medium spiny neurons is indeed associated with a dramatic priming of gene expression present in this cell type, not as present in D2 medium spiny neurons. We can again look at upstream transcription factors that are involved in this priming. E2F factors, again, are highly ranked, which was encouraging because we have since gone back and validated uh, the role of E2F factors. And I wanna highlight that among the topmost prime genes in D1 medium spiny neurons is the FOSB gene. So again, sometimes hunches in earlier research are correct. Nevertheless, seeing this from wholly unbiased open-ended research is extremely important and reassuring. We also have some single cell data that I'm not gonna go over uh, in the interest of time today, but again, I'd be happy to answer questions you might have during the question period. Okay, the last bit of open-ended data that I wanted to tell you about is a proteomic approach that Philip has also led in collaboration with Simone Sidoli who's at Albert Einstein and Ben Garcia, who was at Penn, now at WashU. And uh, this is based on earlier frustrations we had in relating chip sequencing data performed on nucleus accumbens tissue, relying on generic chrominin data in other tissues in other conditions. We performed chip sequencing on uh, several histone modifications asking whether cocaine regulation of a certain histone modification nucleus cummins correlates with cocaine-induced changes in gene expression. But frankly, the overlap between those data sets was never very uh, impressive. It was statistically significant, but unsatisfying. <clears throat> we hypothesized that perhaps we were not looking at the right histone modifications, that what happens with cocaine and nucleus cummins is different from what happens in a cancer cell or a cultured neuron. And so what Philip did was to carry out proteomic analysis of hundreds of histone modifications and other chromin and proteins in uh, uh, nucleus accumbens under the same treatment conditions that I've already described to you. I'm showing you just a small subset of the data here. And it turns out that the two most dramatically regulated histone modifications are two that it would have taken us a long time to get to if we did this in order of uh, their prevalence in the literature. The most dramatic regulation was seen in a variant histone subunit called H2AZ and its acetylation. One of the most dramatic depletion of a histone modification uh, in the chronic 30-day withdrawal time point. And also an induction of this uh, dimethylation of lysine 79 of histone H3 that's induced at this 30-day time point. We are referring to these long-lasting chrominin changes as chrominin scars. The notion is that a history of cocaine exposure can induce histone modifications, a subset of which last a very long time, captured now through this proteomics. And we've been very pleased to see that when we now drill in and study these histone modifications that come from this unbiased analysis, we come up with much more robust overlap with gene expression data. I'll show you that now. So Philip Muse went ahead and I'm gonna only show you data from H2AZ in the interest of time, found that, uh, that after um, that, what, doing chip sequencing for H2AZ or H2AZ acetylation, you see appreciable levels of, of H2A of both under control conditions. There it's induced uh, after acute cocaine exposure, but you can see a dramatic depletion 
that occurs with H2AZ and H2AZ acetylation, really one of the most dramatic effects that we've seen uh, in, in our studies of histone modifications. And now when we relate this H2AZ modification to uh, RNA sequencing data, we can show appreciable overlap far better than anything we've seen before. So if we look at the genomic regions that show depletion of H2AZ or H2AZ acetylation, as to what extent does that correlate with genomic regions of genes that show priming in response to cocaine exposure after long-term withdrawal from cocaine and D1 medium spiny neurons, now one captures well more than half of all of these prime genes. Again, validating the open-ended exposure. Now it's known that a protein called ANP32E plays a role in removing H2AZ from uh, nucleosomes. So that this is ANP32E is a chaperone protein that depletes the genome of histone H2AZ. And from the open-ended proteomic uh, data uh, and uh, our um, uh, RNA-seq data, we were able to demonstrate that AMP32E is indeed dramatically regulated selectively in D1 medium spiny neurons uh, after this 30-day withdrawal time point. Uh, this is an effect in D1 medium spiny neurons, not in D2 medium spiny neurons. And importantly, what Philip was able to show is that when he knocks down ANP32E in the nucleus accumbens, he can prevent H2A2 depletion induced by chronic cocaine exposure. So here's a Western blot for H2AZ and chromin and fractions showing that cocaine in fact causes a dramatic reduction in H2AZ in chrominin consistent with the proteomic data and the chip sequencing data I've already shown you. And that's blocked when we knock down AMP32E. So that led to a series of behavioral experiments that Philip performed with this knockdown strategy. This is a viral mediated knockdown. Uh, in, nu uh, in nucleus accumbens targeting either D1 medium spiny neurons or D2 medium spiny neurons. What Philip was able to show uh, at a higher dose of cocaine where cocaine can produce a significant place conditioning effect uh, to co uh, uh, in these animals that knocking down AMP32E and D1 medium spiny neurons dramatically reduces the rewarding responses to cocaine. But the opposite effect seen when we knock down AMP32E and D2 medium spiny neurons. Here using a lower dose of cocaine that produces a weaker place conditioning effect, we can show an augmentation of that effect upon the D2 selective knockout. Philip is now characterizing animals with these manipulations in self-administration behavior, and importantly, confirming that the AMP32E knockdown in one or both cell types also similarly prevents the priming effects of cocaine uh, withdrawal on expression of individual genes. That leads us to this general model where uh, we at baseline a uh, certain percent of nucleosomes uh, contain H2AZ. In fact, our data suggests that this is enriched over enhancer regions. Um, we know that in response to acute cocaine exposure, the uh, enrichment of H2AZ increases, its acetylation especially increases. But in their chronic withdrawal time point, uh, there is a marked depletion of H2AZ uh, from the genome mediated, we think, through this chaperone protein AMP32E, leading to the establishment of a state of gene priming, readying genes for much more rapid and more robust expression uh, in response to that priming dose of cocaine. So this is a model that we're, we'll be pursuing now 
in the coming years. In the remaining uh, few minutes that I have, I'd like to um, illustrate another approach that my lab has been using, which we call locus-specific epigenome editing. And the need for that is highlighted by this experiment where we can virally manipulate a transcriptional regulatory protein like ANP32E in a cell type specific manner in nucleus accumbens to study effects on behavior, gene expression, and so on. But by manipulating AMP32E, we're gonna be affecting hundreds or thousands of genomic targets, not really testing the effect of a chrominin manipulation at a single gene of interest. And that gets to the need to develop a better quality of proof in the field, manipulating a chrominin or, or transcriptional mechanism at one gene and seeing what happens to gene expression and behavior. So this was, uh, this was work initiated in the lab by Liz Heller, who's now at Penn. And what Liz did was uh, using a suite of zinc finger proteins, just synthetic proteins that were uh, in collaboration with Sigma, bioinformatically predicted to bind to the FOSB gene. This was a very difficult undertaking because Liz had to go through dozens of proteins to identify which of the predicted zinc fingers actually bind to FOSB and regulate FOSB expression, which was an empirical approach. And because what we found in cell culture was not predictive of what happened in the nucleus accumbens in vivo, Liz had to use a viral expression in nucleus accumbens in vivo as her primary screen, a very difficult study. But Liz was able to find a zinc finger that when fused to G9A, which is a histone methyl transferase that methylates histones at uh, lysine 9, it's a repressive histone modification, reduces FOSB expression. Conversely, when she took the same zinc finger protein and fused it with a transcriptional activation subunit, she was able to activate FOSB expression. The zinc finger by itself had no effect on FOSB expression in nucleus accumbens. So the zinc fingers did what we wanted and we were able to show specificity that targeting this histone methyl transferase created this uh, uh, cognate um, histone methylation mark over the zinc finger binding area and it spread more broadly. And conversely, this transcriptional activation subunit uh, focus was also induced over the region of zinc finger binding to the FOSB locus. Uh, these uh, manipulations had no effect on other histone modifications. And we went through quite a lot of uh, experiments to show that binding of these zinc finger proteins was highly specific to the FOSB locus. But this was a difficult approach technically. And more recently, my laboratory and other groups have turned to the use of CRISPR, which is much more versatile. This is work done in the lab by Peter Hamilton, Casey Lardner, uh, and, and others. And, and here is the approach that they used. We wanted to um, now not target a histone modification, but rather target a transcription factor, say CREB, to a gene of interest. So what we did was to take a um, dead Cas9. Cas9 is a uh, protein that can bind to a targeted region of the genome by coupling it to a specific guide RNA. So one can direct dead Cas9 to a single gene by use of this guide RNA. And then we fuse to this Cas9 uh, the, uh, a, a protein CREB. And we use two forms of CREB. Uh, a constitutively active form of PREB, a phosphomimetic mutant that mimics the serine-133 phosphorylation that activates CREB, or an alanine mutation of that site that prevents CREB uh, activation. This is a, a dominant negative mutation. And what we were able to show, these are all data in vivo, in nucleus accumbens involving herpes simplex virus uh, vectors, showing that when we overexpress the dead Cas9 coupled to the constitutively active CREB with a guide RNA that targets the FOSB gene selectively, we could get induction of delta FOSB. 
whereas either alone or the mutation, uh, the, uh, the uh, dominant negative mutation of CREB has no effect. We can use these um, uh, tools behaviorally uh, and uh, to show that when we target this CREB binding to the FOSB gene only, it's sufficient to induce Delta FOSB, which is sufficient to induce the rewarding effects of cocaine illustrated by place conditioning. If we repress Delta FOSB using that G9A construct, we can do the opposite effect, showing that manipulation just of the endogenous FOSB gene can bidirectionally regulate behavioral responses to cocaine. Effects not seen when we manipulate FOSB in D2 medium spiny neurons. And most recently, a study published by Casey Lardner in the lab using these tools, correlating these changes with gene expression. What I'm showing you here are analyses called rank brian kappert geometric overlay, RRHO. Uh, genes, uh, the color in this forward slash diagonal are indicating convergent regulation in the two conditions shown. So what these data illustrate that when we induce FOSB using the CREB CRISPR constructs in D1 medium spiny neurons, we are recapitulating a substantial portion of the transcriptional effects seen with chronic cocaine self-administration, which would be consistent with the data that I've been telling you about uh, during the course of this talk much less convergence when we do this in D2 medium spiny neurons. This is a convergence with Delta FOS B induction and chronic cocaine self-administration, much less overlap seen with acute cocaine responses. So with that, let me just make some concluding remarks and then we should have time for questions. We know that addiction is a syndrome that has powerful psychological, social, and cultural factors. Yet I'm focusing not only on the brain, I'm focusing on something so reductionistic as a cell nucleus deep, somewhere deep within the brain. But we think that this very reductionistic approach is very useful because it provides a template, a periodic table, so to speak, of all the genes that are being modified by a history of cocaine exposure, including genes that are present at synapses, receptors, transporters, many other families of proteins, which control the function of brain reward regions and ultimately the biological forces that drive a state of addiction. I mentioned at the outset that all of the treatments that are used to uh, approach addiction today are focused at proteins at the synapse, uh, we are th these data essentially provide a template of hundreds of other synaptic proteins that can also be targeted. However, they also raise the specter that maybe non-synaptic proteins can also be targeted. Uh, for example, uh, small molecule drugs targeting epigenetic factors, transcriptional factors are now among the most popular in treatment of cancer, many are in advanced clinical trials, um, leading very straightforwardly to clinical trials of some of these molecules which are safe enough uh, in addiction syndromes. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, just make a few general points. I, I hope I've convinced you of the dramatic effects that uh, cocaine has on the transcriptional organization of the nucleus accumbens. I focus today uh, solely on nucleus accumbens. Uh, it's critical to produ produce similar data on many other brain regions that are also very important. I hope I've also convinced you of the importance of unbiased open-ended studies. We still don't know enough about the biology of addiction to know exactly what genes and proteins to focus on selectively. We can't stop fundamental discovery science now and just translate. There's a lot of basic biology that we still need to learn. And the importance of unbiased approaches is that they allow the biology to guide us to focus on 
the proteins and mechanisms that appear most important. So uh, we uh, emphasize the importance of cell specific analyses. I focused on medium spiny neurons, but we also know that there are many types of uh, interneurons and nucleus accumbens that are also very important. We've published some RNA-seq data on two of those interneuron subtypes. And also half of the cells in nucleus accumbens are non-neuronal cells. And we need to look at astroglial cells, oligodendrocytes, microglial cells, endothelial cells, which are also known to regulate the function of these brain reward regions and responses to drugs of abuse. I focus solely on cocaine, but we need to work on many other drugs of abuse, in particular opioids, given the ongoing worldwide epidemic for this uh, class of drugs. I highlighted the notion of chromin and scars, which we think really are important in guiding future efforts to understand how it is that a course of drug exposure changes the brain and behavior for a lifetime. And we are excited to pursue these chromatin scars, establish their causal roles using locus specific neuroepigenome editing tools and see if there may even be some um, therapeutic uh, implications for these uh, discoveries uh, with what I'm showing. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop my sharing and um, be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. So I'm gonna, should I just go through the questions in the Q&A, Ankush and Megan? Uh, or I can read them out for you me? or you could uh, go ahead answering each. Okay, so I'll just start at the top. Uh, David Ashbrook says, what strains used to produce the addiction index? Uh, this is all uh, done in C57 mice, raises a critical point. That's like doing all clinical studies on, on one group of identical uh, twins, so that's not sufficient. We need to look at many more addiction uh, genetic backgrounds in the, uh, in the field. Carl Lidiff asks, what would be the advantage of using gene co-expression network analysis uh, versus DEG analysis? So the DEG analysis is identifying um, genes that are regulated, that, that's important. The gene co-expression network analyses provides information, insights on what genes are related to one another, but also identifies which genes seem to be upstream of the regulation of many others, uh, so-called hub or driver genes. These are all bioinformatic deductions, inferences, so one needs to carry out epigenetic, uh, I'm sorry, one needs to carry out empirical yeah. studies to validate the bioinformatic deductions. So we've been able to do that, other groups have been able to do that. And we're, I'm, a, I'm now a true believer in this bioinformatics because we have had the co-expression network analyses identify genes as important hub genes. Sometimes these hub genes are not even regulated. They're not even differentially expressed genes yet we can demonstrate dramatic effects on gene expression and behavior based on the bioinformatic deductions. Jake Kwan is asking me, are the activation of D1 and D2 median spinal neurons and nucleus accumbens done directly in the NAC or done in the VTA and other brain regions that project onto NAC? So, all of those experiments have been done. The ones I was referring to um, talk about using uh, tools that target the cell bodies of D1 and D2 medium spiny neurons in the nucleus accumbens, but other groups have um, activated the VTA projection from uh, the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, mainly dopamine, but also we know a small GABAergia component, as well as many other uh, projection uh, areas. My good friend, David Weinschenker asks a question. David, this better be a good one and not a hard one. You mentioned that some drug-induced epigenetic changes are labile, others are persistent. What do you think is unique about those that are persistent and become imprinted or what I would produce um, called chromin and scars in brain and then you're taking it even another level to those that might occur 
in sperm and egg cells and become transgenerational? So that's a key question that we're interested in. So when we look to respond to chromatin responses that are labile to those that are long lived, we're trying now to use machine learning to gain insight into what makes a chromatin modification able to be stable. And we don't have any knowledge about that yet. I think that's one of the most important questions for the field though, for us to identify of hundreds of histone modifications, other chromatin mechanisms, which um, mechanisms, uh, what is it about a mechanism that enables it to uh, last a long time? We have an, a couple of anonymous questions. One is, um, did they expect that knockdown of the chaperone protein in D2 mediated spiny neurons would lead to an augmented effect? Why would that be expected? Not necessarily. Uh, we're not, we think that the H2AZ depletion likely occurs in both medium spiny neuron cell types because as, as you saw from the Western blot and the chip sequencing and the proteomics, the depletion is virtually complete in bulk tissue, which means it would almost have to be occurring in both cell types. The fact that one gets opposite responses in D1 and D2 medium spiny neurons is not so surprising because manipulations of the two cell types does result in opposite effects on behavior uh, quite commonly uh, because the way the cells are wired uh, to uh, producing uh, opposite regulation of striatal uh, circuitry. Another anonymous question, what did you think about the similar trends in the cocaine, coke, coke and coke saline groups in terms of H2AZ depletion? Um, we think that there's this, uh, this is from Ankush. So this is, thank you, Ankush. This is, um, oh no, you, you, you answered, you wrote an answer. Sorry about that. Um, so this is, um, we were not surprised by that. We think that this is a long lasting a depletion uh, that occurs as a consequence of long-term withdrawal from chronic cocaine exposure. And, um, you know, we have to understand the mechanisms driving that and effects of cocaine priming. Um, Marina, thank you also for your uh, question. Uh, is ANP 32E promoter a target for Delta Fos B or CREB? This is something that we are asking. We don't think so. It's not so obvious at this point, unfortunately. Um, we are very interested in identifying the transcription factors that control ANP32E expression. That is a active ongoing area of research. Ridwain Aswagu says, are Delta Phosphine and Kreb also implicated in other cells? Uh, yes, uh, they are. Um, we years ago uh, provided some mapping data in the context of cocaine or amphetamine exposure that both proteins are activated across the limbic circuitry. The nucleus accumbens definitely shows the most dramatic response, but the prefrontal cortex, VTA, and many other brain reward regions all show, show regulation of these factors. And we're at the last question with 90 seconds left. Uh, thank you for the talk, appreciate it. Can you please comment on the proteomic data? Is it possible the gene expression of different isoforms are also altered. Yes, so we know in fact that the gene encoding H2AZ is affected in our RNA-seq data set. So again, having RNA-seq, proteomics, ATAC-seq, and we're generating additional open-ended data sets like high c uh, data sets uh, and overlaying them really do provide very useful insights for future directions. So with 30 seconds left, Ankur, I have a few questions. But I, I have a few questions, but then I'll probably just ask one and ask the rest on mail. So you showed how the first exposure to cocaine and, uh, you know, after 30 days, uh, the primed exposure showed, you know, totally opposite effects. Do you think uh, there could be an effect of, you know, fear or confusion in the first, uh, you know, whenever it's administered 
versus when later on uh, cocaine is administered they are kind of used to that experience so it does not stimulate such behavior sure absolutely you know i i think it what you're referring to is important because it talks about any time you manipulate an animal there are so many features that are involved in the animal's behavioral experience and it's very important experimentally to capture as much of that as possible so uh, most of us don't do that in these experiments. You can imagine doing RNA sequencing across the brain regions and conditions with the many other behavioral controls, but it would be useful to dissect that out. Sure. Great, and I think with uh, that, as Eric pointed out, we're exactly at the hour, so we'll wrap it up. Um, again, I had a couple of questions as well, but we'll save those for, for offline. And for anyone who's still um, attending, we'll just remind you again about uh, Dr. Jill Becker, who will we We'll hear from her in two weeks on October 21st about sex differences in the propensity for developing addiction. All right, thanks very much and thank you for the excellent questions. Thank you, Megan and Ankush. Bye-bye. Goodbye.